Well, the Alberta Legislature is back in session, and that means we have a lot of news ahead for you here on this edition of the Alberta Update. I'm Bruce McAllister. Thank you for joining us. A couple of bills dropped this week in the legislature, and the province was forced to go on the offensive with Ottawa yet again. Surprise, surprise. Let's welcome in the Premier and talk about these things uh, and uh, all that she's been up to. Good day, Premier. Hey, Bruce. Hey, Ottawa doesn't seem to take fairness or equity seriously when it comes to all provinces. Uh, this was made very clear, we know, when it announced its carbon tax carve-out uh, on home heating oil for Eastern Canadians. No such carve-out was offered for us here in Alberta or those in the West, and your government has decided to do something about it. Uh, you're taking them to court. Tell us, tell us about what you hope to accomplish. Well, I, I can tell you that one of the reasons why the federal government said they needed to have a, a national floor price for the carbon tax was so that all Canadians were treated fairly and all paid their, their share. And when you create a carve out, as they did for home heating oil, there's two things. It creates regional unfairness. It undermines their argument about a national floor price. And heating oil is one of the highest emitting fuels. And so they've they've undermined the, I think the arguments that they've made to the court, we think it's unconstitutional to treat regions unfairly. And so we're going to ask the court for their opinion now that they've, uh, now that they've done this. You know, by definition in every sense of the word, this is a double standard, clearly. I think even Canadians in Eastern Canada see that. Uh, that said, the tax takes away valuable dollars in sectors like education and health care. And it's it's having a real impact. Can you speak to that and sure. uh, and, and how it affects these uh, these sectors? Certainly can. I mean, we, we uh, have looked at an analysis on what would happen to school boards uh, by 2030. Because remember, what has the real problem with this with this uh, tax is that it keeps on going up year after year, regardless of the kind of impact it's having on affordability. And our public institutions don't get rebates. So by by 2030, we calculate there'll be over 60 million dollars that our school boards have to pay, which is the equivalent of 495 teachers. That's a, an enormous impact that would have on the classroom. With uh, healthcare, it's a very similar story, uh, but we've got far more facilities there and far more use. And so we'd be looking at the potential of not being able to hire nearly a thousand nurses by 2030. The, the one uh, stat that we had for municipalities, we want to see what this would look like across the in, entire um, the entire system. But in Calgary alone, the, the fuel tax in 2023, the carbon tax prevented them from being able to hire another 121 firefighters or police officers. It's having a real impact. It's impacting our public services. It's not fair. It's being, it's unconstitutional. And we think that the, the we're asking the court to strike it down. Oh boy, that brings it home uh, very well for us. Thank you. Uh, and we do have, by the way, Energy and Minerals Minister Brian Jean on a little bit later to talk more about this. Uh, Premier, how about this? Three bills dropped uh, this week, Thursday. They are connected in many ways. They protect kids and they protect women in sport. Let's address each one of them individually. First, the Health Statutes Amendment Act. Well, look, we, we know that there are a lot of uh, children who going through puberty face difficult times and, and some have gender dysphoria or gender confusion. And we want to make sure that those kids are supported in understanding why it is that they feel that way and supporting them and who they want to, to become. But we also know that uh, making decisions that will have a permanent medicalization of those children at a very young age, prevent them from being able to have children of their own one day, create, put them on a pathway of having lifelong need to be able to have medications. Those are decisions that need to be made as adults. And so what we have said is there can be no permanent changes to, um, a, to a person's body when they're 17 years of age and younger. So no, uh, no uh, surgeries, top or bottom, for the purpose of gender reassignment, and also uh, puberty blockers, uh, no puberty blockers for those aged 15 and under. We think that this allows for kids to take the time that they need in order to figure out what it is that they they, they want to, to do as they get older, but we have to make sure that they're not making these decisions prematurely and then ultimately ending up making the wrong decision. And the Education Amendment Act, I've heard you and uh, and others talking about the need to protect kids. Completely. And this is also making sure that the parents aren't kept out of the loop. A lot of uh, the transition uh, that kids go through often starts as a social transition, changing uh, pronouns, changing names, and uh, parents cannot be left out of understanding what's going on with their kids. That's what we have heard loud and clear. So what we're going to, to do is if uh, the, uh, there's a formal name change at a school where a child changes their pronouns or changes their name, that has to be done with parental involvement and consent for minors. 
I should also mention there is more. I mean, we also know that uh, these are very sensitive topics, uh, sexuality, sexual orientation, and gender ideology. And we want parents to be able to know what's going on when these are introduced in the classroom so that they can opt their kids in to the discussion or so that they can at least talk to their kids when they come home at the end of the day. So that's another aspect to it is there's got to be a lot more formal involvement with parents knowing what's being taught in the school. 100%. I hear it from uh, from our network all the time from parents. Uh, they're grateful for it. Hey, the Fairness and Safety in Sport Act, uh, it sounds pretty straightforward, but your hand is, has been forced to protect, I guess, the integrity and safety of women's sports. Yeah, we had a, a young girl today, Hannah, who was one of uh, who stood with us to talk about what had happened with her. She she lost a, a race just by half a step. She'd been try she'd been striving for it for so long, training so hard. She's in competitive sport, and she had lost to a transgender athlete. And she she thought that you know she's prepared to go and uh, and win or lose, but she doesn't think that uh, that it's fair for 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 individuals who are born biologically male to be competing in fe female sports and preventing girls from being able to aspire to the highest levels. So she came forward and she's supportive of uh, having a biological female and girls only, uh, uh, women and girls only category in competitive sports. And we're also going to make sure that there are other open or uh, or 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 co uh, co ed options so that every individual has a right to and an opportunity to participate in competitive sport. Right. And I know you've read about some of the safety issues, you know, um, uh, volleyballs uh, being spiked by uh, powerful people. That's, that's another concern from women. Uh, listen, uh, you've had a busy week. We always appreciate you taking a few minutes for us. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you. You bet. Thanks, Bruce. Another bill that dropped this week is the Alberta Bill of Rights Amendment Act. If passed, Bill 24 would amend the Alberta Bill of Rights to ensure uh, rights and freedoms remain properly protected and reaffirm the values that make Alberta one of the uh, finest places on earth, one of the freest places on earth as well. Uh, here are Justice Minister Mickey Amory and uh, the Premier uh, from the announcement that was made earlier this week. Three proposed amendments to the preamble of the Alberta Bill of Rights would address values important to Albertans specifically freedom, family, and the rule of law. The Alberta Bill of Rights Amendment Act responds to concerns our government has heard from Albertans regarding their fundamental rights and freedoms. If passed, the Alberta Bill of Rights Amendment Act would strengthen the rights of Albertans and continue to serve Albertans well in an involving society and reflect our shared values. Let me be clear, our government will always stand up for the rights of Albertans. It is our honor and our duty to do so. Our province is founded and grounded on individual freedom and personal responsibility. These amendments to the Alberta Bill of Rights are not just legal changes. They are a reaffirmation of the values that make Alberta one of the freest jurisdictions on earth. They are about protecting our rights and our freedoms and ensuring our province continues to be home to freedom, democracy, and a way of life that we will continue to cherish for generations. Significant updates to the Alberta Bill of Rights since it was introduced, that was back in 1972. Uh, several proposed changes were informed by recommendations in the final report uh, from the Public Health Emergencies uh, Governance Review Panel. Uh, many of those changes would align the Alberta Bill of Rights with the approach uh, to fundamental rights in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. As we discussed with the Premier, the Education Amendment Act was introduced in the legislature this week. Uh, the Education Minister, Demetrius Nicolaitis, will of course be carrying this bill through uh, the debate. He joins us now to, uh, to chat more about it. Good day, Minister. Thanks so much, Bruce. Good to see you. How will this bill uh, support student success and well-being? Let's start there. Yeah, so the, the primary way that this will support student success and, and well-being, there's actually two primary ways, I should say. First and foremost, it'll make sure that inappropriate material uh, is not available to uh, young students um, and, and that material is age appropriate. When we're talking about things like human sexuality, gender identity, uh, and other topics, uh, we have seen some situations whereby explicit or inappropriate material is made available to students. So the bill will uh, provide a vehicle to make sure that the ministry is approving any and all material and any and all third party presenters that want to come into a school. 
uh, to talk about these topics. In addition, it will also make sure that parents are much more involved in their kids' education. And so uh, by achieving those two goals, we can make sure that we're supporting students' success and well-being. Why is it important to strengthen those ties, Minister, between, uh, between the parents and their, and their children's education? Well, the vast majority of parents, of course, are, are loving and caring and want what's best for their kids. And uh, they are, of course, uh, the primary drivers of their kids' education, uh, the primary caregivers of their children. And so it's important that when we're talking about a child's education, parents, as well as education partners, are working as closely as possible together to support uh, that individual child. And so when we have that kind of situation and everyone is working together in the best interest of the child, we can ensure that uh, we are taking care of their unique needs. You know, I've heard it, I've heard a lot of parents talk about some concern about uh, maybe what's being taught in the classroom from time to time, and they would have liked to have been more aware of some of these things. How are you addressing that or are you addressing that? Yeah, we absolutely are. And I have heard some of those concerns as well. So with the bill, if it's passed, it will give the ministry the uh, ability to authorize and approve any third party presenters that are to come into a school and any material, any books uh, or other material that is to be used in a classroom setting uh, on the on the topics of human sexuality, uh, gender identity. Uh, or, or these other areas. And so this will make sure that um, we are overseeing the material and making sure that things are uh, uh, appropriate for the age of the student, uh, things are um, sensitive to the, the needs of students, and we're checking very carefully what third party groups or individuals want to come into a school and what they want to talk about. So. Uh, this this will ensure that um, we, we close the loop on some of those. In addition, we'll also be changing the legislation so that parents must opt in to any conversation or discussion about these topics. So the school boards will have to send parents notice and explain to them, these are the discussions that we're going to be having over the course of the school year. Uh, they must notify them at least 30 days in advance, and the parents uh, will have the ability to decide whether they want their child to participate in that conversation or not. Okay, one more. Um, children, obviously, were, were heavily disrupted. They're learning during COVID. I know part of your bill is about making sure that the learning continues during states of emergency and, uh, and public health uh, emergencies. So what are you hoping to uh, address, or what are you addressing here? Yeah, the government, of course, did a review about uh, the response to COVID-19, um, and we are, will be implementing some of those recommendations uh, through the Education Amendment Act that we have now live on the floor. What we'll be doing is uh, strengthening in-person learning and uh, making in-person learning have greater priority and uh, preference, um, and also we'll be requiring school boards to have clear policies in place about how they shift to online learning during an emergency if that's necessary, the, and making it clear that they have to provide a timeline to parents about how long they're going to be online if there's a public health emergency, and what other steps they're taking to provide in-person learning options for students. So the whole intent is to limit um, disruptions to students uh, should there be a future public health emergency, recognizing that in-person learning is the best option for students. All right, Minister, uh, look forward to, to robo robust uh, debate. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. All the best. All right, the Minister of Education, Demetrius Nicolaitis, joining us uh, on the program. The mandate for the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation is expanding. Over the past five years, the AIOC has had great success in facilitating investments in natural resources. Building from that success, it will now help leverage investments in agriculture, in telecommunications and transportation projects with up to $3 billion in loan guarantees. It is hoped 
hoped that this new focus uh, will open doors to even more opportunities for Indigenous communities to be partners in prosperity while showcasing their rich cultures, histories, and traditions to the world. Well, there's a f- uh, familiar face to us, and uh, if you're with us at the top, uh, you heard the Premier uh, talking about pushing back against Ottawa when it comes to its carbon tax carve-out for Eastern Canadians. Well, our Minister of Energy and uh, Resources, Brian Jean, uh, Minerals. Did I get your ministry all messed up, Minister? Energy and minerals, if it's in the ground, it's something to do with me, so... Okay, well, thank you. Um, I fixed myself on the fly. Hey, listen, this car vote has uh, has a lot of people, I think, in Western and Eastern Canada, a little ticked off. You're taking you're taking the feds to court over it now. We sure are. Uh, it's ludicrous. They're carving out, uh, you know, home heating oil, which is nowhere near as as uh, environmentally friendly as natural gas, which obviously we use predominantly in Western Canada. In Eastern Canada, they use heating oil as a as a feedstock. But I mean, let's be honest. The federal government only gets its jurisdiction through international treaties and conventions. And there's no international treaty uh, by any of the international community that says, you know, we have to, you're allowed to do this. In fact, it's actually very counterintuitive to what we're trying to do. We're trying to reduce carbon. We're trying to reduce GHGs and and emissions. And yet something that is intensely uh, carbon and the GHGs mm-hmm. that put off is one of the highest, and, and yet they're carving it out and, and sending it to be used. It's actually uh, exactly what their authority says they can do. I'm going, to fo- I'm going to follow up on that in just a second, Minister. But uh, look, Ottawa's playing favorites here. There's no question. And um, I don't think Canadians uh, on, on either side of the country are impressed. It doesn't, doesn't appear to be good leadership to pit one side of the country against the other. Um, um, I mean, is that how you see it? And, uh, you know, what would, what would your message to them be? It's shameful. They're pitting one part of the country against another, uh, which is totally against cooperative confederation and what we're supposed to be doing. The Supreme Court of Canada told us, both both of us, both the Alberta government and the federal government, you have to work cooperatively with each other. you got to get along. And to carve out one part of the country versus another is just not working towards that goal that we know the Supreme Court of Canada wants us to and and frankly is in the best interest of Canadians. We have to treat all Canadians the same and it's one more example of why Justin Trudeau and the Liberals need to be removed from power. They're just not treating Canadians fairly or acting in our best interests. Well, you, I, I know you realize the Premier echoed exactly what you're saying earlier in the program. Hey, building off the car vote, uh, which deals with domestic uh, heating fuel emissions, we do have uh, some overlap globally. Tell us how Alberta can lower emissions on a global scale. Well, Bruce, it's no secret that we have oil, but we also have unlimited amounts of natural gas. And natural gas can be converted into hydrogen and ammonia uh, as a carrier and be sent over to the world all over the world, Japan, Korea, they actually are seeking opportunities to use hydrogen. Uh, many people don't know this, but Korea has a lot of hydrogen cars on the road already and a lot of hydrogen gas stations. So, uh, you know, they're ready. They want to do their part for the world and and uh, they want to buy a lot of hydrogen from us and we can convert it right here in Alberta. If they're not going to let us send our natural gas overseas through LNG and other ways, then we're going to utilize it here to, to convert it into hydrogen and send that overseas. And it's a high value add on our natural gas and uh, there's no better place in the world to buy natural gas low emitting natural gas the lowest form of natural energy um, and as well in abundance cheaper than anywhere else as well so we can really help the world get off coal and that's what we should that's what we should do we should be focusing on making sure our natural gas is the primary source not coal here here uh minister very, very, well, I would say this, you you are very well known to be pretty connected to the grassroots. Uh, your finger is on the pulse of where Albertans are at. I know you spend a lot of time in your constituency. Having said that, I ask you a two-parter uh, before I let you go. Uh, are the markets responding to any of this news and what are you hearing from Albertans on it? Well, it's surprising, actually. Most Albertans don't know that we have an incredible uh, geology here in Alberta. We're one of the best jurisdictions in the world as far as our geology to do carbon capture and sequestration and one of the best places in the world as far as the legal framework as well. So 
doing our part through carbon capture is going to be far more than almost any jurisdiction in the world can do. And it's just one of the many examples of where Alberta's leading edge on technology, on energy, whether it's hydrogen, ammonia uh, as carrier for hydrogen, whether it's it's natural gas or whether it's frankly uh, the ability to have clean coal to some degree or use cogen. We are world leaders in all those things. And we're very proud to have some of the best power generators in the world. We're world leaders on that as well because we have a private sector power generation uh, market. So, you know, in so many things, we're leading the world and we are decarbonizing as we go and showing the rest of the world how to do it. When people come here to Alberta, they always say to me, number one, they say, how come your AER works so good? Your Alberta Energy Regulator, why is it so good? And number two, how do you do CCUS? Because we know we have to turn to it. Korea, for instance, Bruce, not to belabor the point, but they're looking at opportunities to go offshore to sequester carbon. And you can imagine how expensive that is compared to in the industrial heartland at Edmonton. You can drill down and pump it into the earth. It turns into liquid. It's safely stored there forever. It's a uh, Alberta's got great geology and, and great legal system to be able to do exactly what we need to do here and lead the world and help the world decarbonize. And knowing all of that is why you are an excellent minister of energy and minerals. I'll end it correctly. Uh, minister, thanks for your time. Always appreciate having you on. And I love the people, Bruce. I do this for the people. You bet. There is Brian Jean uh, on the Alberta update with us today. Well, Alberta has become the small business hub of Canada. Uh, with strong common sense policies, Alberta is attracting more new business than ever before, as will be evidenced by uh, some of the numbers. Alberta saw an average of uh, 1,945 more active businesses. That was between January and July when compared with the same period last year. This 1.6% uh, increase far surpassed the Canadian average, which was just 0.6%. Alberta is the top destination for business innovation and creation nationwide. Making up 95% of those businesses in the province, by the way, Alberta's small businesses employ almost 30, 35% of our private sector workforce and contribute 27% of the province's GD, GDP. Uh, many sectors leading the charge with Alberta's uh, world-class tourism industry continuing its strong performance in 2024. In fact, Alberta's overall tourism business increased by 3.2% in the first seven months of 2024, the second highest increase in the country. And that does it for this edition of the Alberta Update, a first-hand look at what's happening with your government, what your premier and ministers are up to. Uh, we do this every couple of weeks, and when the legislature sits, we try to bring it uh, every week. Uh, we always appreciate you tuning in. It is, uh, it is Halloween week, so whatever you're doing, be safe and uh, have fun. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time.